if you have a strong subscription base, you can build a more sustainable business in many ways. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I am so excited to have my next co-founding team of guests here uh, to talk a little bit about their startup uh, called Prive. And if you don't know what Prive is, you're going to learn all about it and going to be really, really excited to meet the co-founders, Claudia Laurie and Alex. Okay, I'm going to try and say this last name, Crescium. Yes. Trying really hard. Well, okay. Yeah, awesome. And uh, so we, I have them both here today, which uh, is a really, really special opportunity to hear not only about Prive and a little bit about um, their journey, but also just I people ask all the time, like, do you need a co-founder? How do you how do you think about finding a co-founder? All of these things. And when I met Claudia, I was on her podcast. Uh, a couple of months ago, and that's when I thought, gosh, she she and Alex would be terrific to come on and really talk about their journey and talk a little bit more about Prive as well and why they did it. But um, let me just give you a little bit of background. So co-founders and CEOs of Prive, which is a digital platform helping smaller businesses compete with giants like Amazon uh, and others through flexible and easy to use e e-commerce subscriptions, which anybody who's in D2C knows that subscriptions is really the key to the kingdom. Certainly, we know this at, at, uh, at Hint for sure, So, which is like 50% of our business is direct-to-consumer and a uh, pretty healthy subscription program going on. So it's something that uh, near and dear to my heart for sure. So these two founders met while they were both working at Uber. As, I mean, Uber, another great right. thing happened from Uber, right? Um, as project ma at project managers in the company's early, early startup days, and they were able to form a connection and began chatting about the trends that they were seeing and, and ultimately Prive was born. So during their time at, at Uber, they both really started noticing this whole subscription um, really revolution, um, the sub substantial rise in subscription businesses. And after talking a bit, they decided to jump in, but I'm going to let them tell more of that story. And I can't wait to dive into having these two guests on. So welcome, Claudia and Alex. Thank you Thank so much you. for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So, so before we get into Prive, take us back to the beginning. Tell us well, each of you tell us a little bit more about uh, growing up and and kind of what you thought you were going to be doing. Let's start there. <laughs> totally, I can I can take a stab at that first. Um, so I originally hail from Australia, actually, um, but then grew up in New York, moved to the states when I was quite young, and then went to Harvard in 2014, thinking that I was going to start my career in fashion and retail. Actually, as a kid, I was constantly enterprising in like the fashion space. Um, I had won this global Barbie design competition where they started manufacturing these Barbie clothes that I had designed. I actually went to all these like fashion summer camps and like made clothes for like teddy bears and like webkins and sold them to my friends. And so it was really no surprise that when I went to college, I was really dead set on getting real world experience in the, sort of the fashion and retail industry. And so really it was after my first year in school, I started working at um, Calvin Klein. So under kind of PVH as a e-commerce merchandiser was super excited for this like double wears Prada moment, which it was not quite the reality of it. Um, I was doing a lot of kind of price analysis. I had spreadsheets of all these SKUs. I was in the back of the Calvin Klein men's underwear closet, making sure that the correct SKUs were on discount on Macy's.com. And it was definitely a long summer. I think it was at that point in time, a lot of my friends were actually studying computer science. They were software engineers. They were having these like really cool tech company internships in the Valley. And I started thinking like, hey, like what is it about fashion that really interests me? It's kind of this endless creativity that you can flex on. And so decided that I was going to switch majors to CS and give it a go. Um, definitely did not uh, lose my passion for kind of e-commerce and fashion as my first few projects 
switching into CS was one, building like an e-commerce storefront, and then two, building an iPhone app that was a personal stylist. Um, but I think, you know, as I continued my studies, I realized that product management was really where I wanted to be because that was kind of the intersection of the business aspect, um, engineering, as well as design, and ended up at Uber. But prior to that, I also really wanted to play around with the Shopify ecosystem and start my own DTC store, as that was something that was really hot back in 2015 and kind of burgeoning. So I put together my own Shopify store and fa found a manufacturer in China and started selling these more fashionable college branded um, sweaters and jackets, essentially, and really learned a lot through that experience of what it takes to start something from scratch, specifically in the Shopify ecosystem. And there weren't that many tools available to help me scale and help me market. And I took a lot of those learnings from a few years doing that um, to Prive today. So that was a little bit of my early experience. I would say mine is also a typical immigrant story. I was uh, born in a small town in Romania and immigrated in my teens to Canada uh, with my family. And I uh, grew up and went to college there. And I think unlike any other tier, any other teens, I would say, um, I didn't really have a fascination with like any specific industry or didn't really know what I wanted to do. I loved creating things. And I think at some point I was convinced that I was going to become an artist, uh, a fine artist, like a painter. And to this day, I still kind of, you can find me doodling or painting something. So that's still kind of in the, the back of my DNA. But uh, it was in the last year of high school that I would say I started my first business. And this was a grocery delivery service. And it was actually at the same time as Instacart was getting started. So it was 2013, 2012. I thought of that in hindsight. Um, and this was kind of in the sur sur suburbs. It was meant for college students to kind of have uh, groceries delivered to, to their dorm. And so it was that that gave me my first exposure to entrepreneurship, just getting in the car, going to Walmart, opening my the app that we had built, seeing like kind of the items that they wanted to add to cart and having it delivered and even knocking on people's doors and uh, older folks telling us like why don't you guys kids go get a landscaping job like this is uh, this well, what is this uh, delivery service I can just get in my car in the suburbs and go grab my groceries so that was kind of my experience my first experience with entrepreneurship I didn't know what the words meant um, I didn't know kind of what it entailed but uh, it stuck with me and throughout college I spent all my summers working on various different entrepreneurial entrepreneurial projects and um, you know kept going with kind of the uh, similar crew of folks as we kept on working on many different things. And so that brought me to uh, uh, graduating with a double degree in computer science and um, business and uh, brought me to my first job as, at Uber as a product manager. And similar similar story to Claudia, I wanted to be as close to kind of the, the product, the revenue uh, as possible, despite my parents saying, hey, what is this? What are, you, what are you working on previously on your on your startups? What is that? Go get a real job. Go work in banking. Go go work, go work in consulting, whatever all the other folks are doing in my, in my college. And so that's kind of um, how I uh, came to to meet Claudia as well. That's awesome. So you two met while you were at Uber. Were you guys working on the same team or were you the same floor or any? How did you guys meet each other? Yeah. So we both joined as associate product managers and it's kind of one of the few like really excellent new grad rotational programs if you want to be a product manager in the Valley. And so we were in the same cohort of 10. And so we never worked together on the same team, but really started at the same time. And it's a super tight knit community. So big plug for the Uber APM program for anyone who wants to kind of break into product management. What sort of attracted you to think like, oh, this could be my co-founder? Like, how did you guys tell me the story about this? We had always been incredibly great friends um, and I think shared a similar mindset. We started doing a lot of projects outside of work, really. We were painting together. I know Alex alluded to his passions as an artist. And we, you know, we were thinking about putting together uh, like an online art gallery. Um, and, you know, really, we just sort of built this level of trust. And we're also partners as well. So um, we kind of have that relationship aspect. Um, and really, yeah. Yeah, and really, it was during COVID where 
there was a lot of time. Everything was different. Folks were kind of questioning what the next few years and what their futures look like. And we just really threw ourselves into working on side projects together, whether it be art or even just coming up with ideas for apps and just exploring new spaces. And I think I never met someone that I had worked so well with and had so much trust with and just shared the same outlook on kind of what we wanted and kind of why we were motivated to start something. So I think it's really important with any co-founder to really find someone where you have kind of an aligned vision for what you want to do in the future, but also kind of have that foundation of trust. Alex, let's jump into Prime. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, obviously you'd had uh, some experience in, in working with consumers and direct to consumer. You mentioned your grocery delivery um, program, yes. but what, what was the problem that you saw out there that you felt like you could solve? Yeah, I think uh, we are starting to look at the e-commerce space as we are um, as we are coming out of our experience, kind of at Uber, and realizing where that industry was. And so, where was e-commerce outside of kind of the closed system that of the Amazons of the world or the uh, or the larger kind of players? And we saw a massive growth in this direct to consumer space of very creative folks that were taking existing industries and uh, existing products, uh, whether it be in food and beverages or whether it be in, um, in consumer goods and uh, creating, um, you know, new new enterprises. Um, and we saw a massive growth there and we saw the initial platforms kind of being built uh, like the Shopify's, the Magento's of the world. And then you can kind of get a little bit more into how we're specifically helping our customers. But um, really, Alex and I started Prive because we saw this need for growing e-commerce brands to really access the tools and science to enable them to compete and grow in this constantly growing and constantly more competitive market. Especially, you know, you have the Amazons of the world and it's really difficult for a small team who's just starting to get going to have the same level of infrastructure and the same level of intelligence and the same optimizations that you would if you were a seller, let's say on the Amazon platform. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you as a young brand want Amazon to solely be your channel of sale. You want to build out your own DTC channels, your own storefront, own your customer experience and build those relationships. Um, and so really looping back to my early passions and experience in retail, I really saw how painful it was to enable things like smart pricing or discounts or building those relationships with customers and kind of incentivizing a repeat purchase. Um, but at Uber and really other tech companies, there were massive teams and all this science behind a lot of the challenges that these brands are thinking through. And so with Prive, we are building a platform of intelligent tools for DTC brands to kind of bridge that gap between those small teams who might not necessarily have the background to make these smart decisions around pricing, around subscriptions, um, around you know product performance, for example. And we really want to be that platform for them as they grow and as the market matures, essentially. And so, you know, throughout our conversations with DTC founders, other brands, and really, I think the, the most critical thing to understanding where to play is hear what their hair on fire needs are and like be obsessed with what the customer problems are. And so we kept on hearing whether we were talking about kind of pricing or we were talking about, you know, marketing to customers or just really the, the, the whole set of their needs, one thing that kept on coming up was how broken the recurring revenue and subscriptions experience was and how much headroom existed in order to provide a platform that really helped consumers engage with the brands, enable flexibility so that consumers can continue to repeat and purchase from brands, but might have different products or might have different cadences. Um, and it was just an interesting opportunity to help brands build that long-term relationship in a way that was sustainable. And it was something that we just couldn't stop thinking about. So to break it down, so somebody's got a Shopify store and um, they've got a subscription element on there. How can Prive help an existing store do better? 
as Claudia mentioned, we're kind of on that mission to empower e-commerce brands with this next generation of intelligent tools. And our subscription platform is one of the one of those tools. We're providing merchants with the platform to one, enable and manage and grow their subscriptions um, revenue for physical goods. So uh, what this means is twofold. One is getting up and running. So you know, through our platforms, merchants can configure their storefronts for recurring transactions, set up their first intelligent subscription offering that customers can purchase and then later manage and do that within minutes. So that's just kind of the table stakes. Um, you know, we've, the shoppers have spoken and they um, think that um, currently it's not easy for them to actually go in and understand what do they have on a subscription basis after they've purchased it. They can't manage that subscription. Uh, what if they have too much product that has been accruing uh, at home because actually the cadence that they purchased on purchased it on was not the right cadence. And so how do we enable that configurability for um, the shopper as well when they've purchased a subscription to pause it, to potentially skip um, a delivery to even say, hey, this product that I purchased on subscription was actually not the right flavor. I didn't really quite like this. So typically they would cancel their subscription with Prive. They can go in quickly through the uh, through their um, uh, through their app and request a different flavor, for example, or and choose a different flavor that they're going to have um, delivered. And so it's all about creating subscriptions that uh, fit into the lifestyle and the needs of their customers. So we like to think of kind of our customer as the as the merchant. Uh, but in reality, we really have to think of the whole experience end to end. Uh, and the shoppers are truly some uh, a stakeholder that we're really focusing on and what other providers of subscriptions platforms have really not focused on in the past. Interesting. And so if you're on Shopify or Magento or any other platform, yours is an add on that could go into whatever they're on. Yeah, this is uh, an app that you install and within five minutes, you're up and ready with all these components that I've mentioned, whether it is kind of the ability to set up a take a current product that you have it in your inventory and set it up on a recurring basis, the storefront components, so how the customer is going to engage with that offer that you've created as a merchant, um, and also the other piece, which is how the shopper is going to engage post-purchase into kind of their, um, their life cycle uh, in managing that subscription. And so typically in the past, uh, uh, issues like, for example, customers not being able to cancel a subscription or reach out, having to reach out to customer service, merchants having to spend uh, enormous amounts uh, of money dealing with that overhead and to create different processes. All of this is kind of taken into a one-click install for the application that takes care of all those stakeholders and all those surfaces and provides a cohesive experience. And so Prive is really there to manage that relationship that you're having with your customer for the recurring side of your, of your business. I love it. That's awesome. So for those who are listening, who are uh, not D2C people, uh, or maybe they they are a consumer, but they don't really, they're, they're not in this business. Why is subscription businesses so critical for a company that is in the D2C game? There's three key areas where subscriptions are really helpful. And one is that they help build long-term relationships between customers and their brands. And I think that's really where the future of e-commerce is. Um, we can look at you know SMS platforms, messaging platforms. All of those are built in helping bridge the gap between a store and the end customer. And so if you have you know, invested in all of that marketing cost to get that first purchase and you finally have that initial customer, then you should absolutely do whatever you can in order to cultivate that relationship so that customer continues to purchase. And ultimately, you'll end up building better product and offering um, better options for those consumers once you start building those relationships. So subscriptions is an, a critical entry point to that. And then two, subscriptions really help maximize LTV. So very much the point of, hey, if you can enable someone to buy the products that they truly love in a seamless way so that they can continue to get that product, that's only going to make that customer more valuable to the business in the future. And I think there's a lot of really intelligent things that you can do around personalization around providing incentives for your most loyal customers. 
And all of that stems from having this foundational contract or relationship with a subscriber. And then three, I think it really helps brands plan and grow. If you have a strong subscription base, you're able to preempt what you know, demand is going to be in the future. And you can build a more sustainable business in, in many ways. And I know that investors are often looking to brands to say, how are, how are you going to get repeat revenue? You know, Can you give me revenue projections? And subscriptions is a critical part in being able to provide that. And a critical, I think, it, it, it's an indicator of how successful your brand could be, right? Yeah. It, it's, it, I always share with people, when we started our direct-to-consumer business in 2012, um, Amazon was just starting their subscription, their Amazon Prime program, um, yeah. which uh, back then was basically only subscriptions. And that's what it was all about. I think it's a, a little more than that now. But uh you know, that was really what gave me confidence to be able to start our own store at drinkhint.com was that we had a strong subscription business going on Amazon. So totally. ag again, it's a, it's a component that a lot of people think like, oh, I'm already online. Like, should I actually have it? But everything that you said and the planning and, um, you know, that that is so key to being to really understanding kind of what could be with your business. Yeah. And I think the other interesting thing is like subscriptions as a concept is so table stakes for many other businesses. You would never think, okay, I'm just going to buy some online software once and then not use it again. There's, you know, subscription component to your, your SaaS, you know, products, Netflix, really a lot of digital goods. And yet that has not necessarily been ingrained in the consumer for physical products oh, yeah. yet with kind of this move towards everything being online and, you know, COVID has really accelerated that by 10 years, the consumer will become more and more comfortable with saying, hey, yeah, like, I don't want to continue having to go and purchase something from scratch. Like, I, I do want my water that I drink every day on a subscription basis, like I consume my Netflix. So I think it's a really interesting juncture in kind of taking a lot of the models that software has had and applying it to physical product. I love that. So the so the pandemic, how did when did Prive actually get started? Yeah, we were we got started early this year. So okay. closed our first round of fundraising February of this year. So it's been about six months, but definitely in the thick of of work from home and pandemic thing. life. So the so you decided to start before the pandemic, though you guys were thinking about this, right? And um, and so how did the pandemic really accelerate things in your mind in, in many ways? You know, there were some macro level changes, like the first three months of COVID accelerated kind of e-commerce by 10 years. And then you could look at the growth of subscription. It was growing, you know, 90% year over year to the point where I think roughly 3% of e-commerce sales in the U.S. are on a subscription basis. And when you can't go to Whole Foods or Target in person and you can't go to your favorite store and buy kind of like the sweater that you need or the cleaning products that you need to clean your home with, you start looking online. And I think, you know, my parents, for example, are definitely kind of from the previous generation and they would never buy anything online. They were like so anti-subscription because I think they had this mentality that back in the day, like you could never cancel a subscription. Like that was so difficult, like old gym memberships. And yet because of lockdown and because everything was now online, they had to start subscribing to things. And they actually started subscribing to things and ordering things on a recurring basis. And it was so interesting to see that shift in their mindset when it came to shopping. And they're not alone. I think most consumers started to really change their behaviors. And I think it was no surprise that this is where kind of the e-commerce industry was heading. But this was such an interesting window of opportunity where we got so much growth in such a concentrated period of time that Alex and I were kind of looking at each other saying like, hey, we can't miss this window. There is so much to be had here. The market is so hot. And yet, not that mature, um, there is a lot of headroom for us to innovate and, and help businesses and consumers alike. 
the the other thing that I think was uh, incredibly um, interesting was just to see what level of infrastructure had been built already. Yeah, it's very easy for someone to go online and and start a business and start posting some products, and then the number one question becomes, how do I generate demand? How do I get people to know that I exist as a as a D two C brand? How do I get uh, folks to buy my products? But then the next set of questions start to come in, which is, how do I start scaling up and how do I start winning and competing against the folks that already have figured out demand generation and figured out those things. And you can look at Amazon as kind of a big platform that's um, that's uh, dealing with all those things in-house as a product team, as a big company. And we're seeing kind of that lack of leadership existing in the e-commerce space overall for the folks that are not on, on those platforms and realizing that, hey, Prive is here to kind of build, like we said, um, the next generation of intelligent tools for the e-commerce space as a whole. I love it. So you touched on this a few minutes ago, the raising capital. You guys had just closed around. So neither of you had raised capital before. So tell us, like, how how was it? Like, how, I mean, was it scary? I mean, did you, how did you know what to do? It was probably one of the most concentrated learning experience I've had. Um, it was an incredibly unique experience to also do this remotely. Um, this was, you know, while everything was on Zoom, um, but it was fascinating to be able to have, you know, pitches lined up and be able to tell your story, tell your mission, pitch your company, and then get a very quick feedback cycle. It's just, you know, a few days later, you would get feedback as to kind of what their objections were or whether they were excited to move forward or, you know, what they were thinking through. And so I think it was just a really fascinating point in time where we were early on enough that we were pitching and we could huddle up after every pitch and say, hey, did this message land? Or, okay, we keep hearing these objections. How can we handle this better? And, you know, over many, many pitches, it ends up being a kind of performative experience where you are constantly able to slightly tweak things and really kind of get closer to what resonates. And, it was it was it was really really cool, stressful, and you know hard at times. But looking back on it, I, I have quite fond memories of the experience. I would say that you know grit and tenacity are are definitely required. I think the thing that I didn't realize was how many pitches there were going to be because you often hear these stories of hey like three pitches over a weekend and then you close your whole round. You know, when you're pitching throughout the holidays, when all of this is, you know, remote, that's absolutely not the case for most entrepreneurs. And so I, I think it was definitely a, uh, a marathon, but a one that had pretty, pretty awesome rewards. How many uh, meetings did you actually have before uh, you started getting, getting Tons. some, yeah, before you started getting traction? Tons, I think. And then also, it's not just, you know, you meet with a fund and you have one meeting and it's over. It's like there's follow ups, there's, you know, they want to double click and do a demo. And so, you know, with one fund, you might have, you know, up to five conversations. So it's very easy to kind of get into like 40, 50 pitches very quickly. I would say that what Claudia is mentioning here is is very much reflective of what it takes to get your first set of customers, and it doesn't sound like a it sounds like a very similar experience of kind of putting something out there, refining the framing, refining the product, which in this essence is the business or the deck, and um, and kind of going through as many customers uh, calls as possible to kind of get folks that are interested to come in at this early stage and try your product. So I think the 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 takeaway for me there was that. This was just the starting uh, for much more, many more similar conversations to, to come uh, as an entrepreneur. I think, uh, oh, sorry, Karen. Oh, no, go ahead. no, go ahead. I was going to say, oh, yeah, go for no, it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that I think um, this is a point that really resonated to me in your book, Undaunted, which is like, you just can't. You can't like get overwhelmed with the fact that there will be 50 pitches and you will get a lot of objections and it will be hard. You really just need to take it day by day. And I think I've spoken to a lot of folks who are starting to fundraise or are thinking about fundraising. And there's this like mental block around like, oh, I don't want to go through this entire process. Yeah. But if you can just take it a day at a time and this goes for the lifespan of your entire business, it you can you can really enjoy the process along the way. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's interesting just thinking, I bet working at Uber was 
a good thing for you guys, right? It's a brand where I, I think about my dad used to tell me when I started my career at Time Magazine, you know, I was hemming and hawing, is this like the right place to be? And and my dad really believed like you can't go wrong by starting at a brand, even if it's not what you ultimately want to be doing. I mean, it's it's brands win, right? You want to build a brand and and someday somebody's going to be talking about Prive, right? Like that they built, they were working at Prive and and we certainly have those people who have worked at uh, Hint as interns over the years. And it's a lot of fun to think about it as when people say Hint is a brand and you're like, it is. Uh, you know, I mean, 16 years later, it's it's uh, you know it's a lot of fun. But it's I love talking to people when they're just in the building stages, and because it will be, it will be a brand. And obviously, you were at Uber when it was you know building its brand too. So it's a very very exciting thing to watch. And if you can be a part of uh, the build and and support founders, I think it's. Uh, it's something that is such a valuable lesson later on in life. Maybe it's going to help you raise money for your own startup, or you know, maybe it's just going to be you can look back and think about all that you learned along the way. Because I bet there's so many things that you guys learned in your experience at Uber and um, your other startup, Alex, too, and and even Calvin Klein, where nothing's ever a waste of time. It's right. there's you're going to pull. Um, from all those different experiences in order to create what you guys have created, which is so cool. So, uh, Claudio, you and I were on, were talking a few months ago on your podcast, The Room, uh, that you've had four seasons now of The Room. So tell me a little bit about how did you decide to start your podcast? Yeah, I think um, so. I started my podcast before Alex and I started Prive, not long before. Um, me and my podcast co host, Madison, we'd been friends for a long time. And um, she was just starting her career in venture. And, you know, Alex and I were just starting to think about Prive. And we were leaning on a bunch of mentors around kind of this career change, thinking a little bit more about entrepreneurship. I wanted to get a better understanding of what it really was like to start something. And so we were having these conversations. And I think, you know, Madison and I, we always wanted to do something together. Um, and, you know, podcasting became huge. Audio was massive, especially when you couldn't hang out in person. And so um, I think we were like, hey, like, we are having some really awesome conversations about, you know, you going into venture and about me starting something. Um, This would be really helpful to open up to a bunch of other folks who are thinking about kind of starting something or entering into this industry. And so that's why we called it The Room. We're trying to open the doors um, to these conversations to really help inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. And it's, it's been awesome in many ways because I can have a lot of fascinating conversations and build mentorship relationships with many of our guests um, like yourself, Kara. Thank you. Well, it's, it's such a good podcast and you've had amazing guests on it. So if you, if, if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to the room, you should definitely, definitely check it out. So Alex, what do you think has been the toughest thing that you've been surprised by in, in building this company? What's sort of been the, the kind of, huh, I, I didn't really think that that was going to happen. What's been the ch- biggest challenge or biggest surprise? I think startups are kind of the gift that keeps on giving. So so nothing uh, is uh, particularly easy. But I think the set of challenges are very much tied to the, the stage of company that we are at. Um, you know, early stage, I think finding the right people to join the team is is one of the most important things. So I would say recruiting is you can read about it in books. You can even do it at a big company, for example, and, and try to bring folks in. But then you realize that actually, to your point, Kara, what is bringing in those people? Well, it's the brand. So what actual work have you done as a recruiter to bring in those folks? Probably not a lot in terms of like the heavy lifting of convincing someone to join something that doesn't exist in the world or that is very early stages. And so um, I think recruiting is one. And then second, I would say, you know, getting the first set of customers and similar to, I think, the pitching process, which I think to some folks hearing that you have to do 50 pitches to get one conversion sounds sounds uh, sounds crazy. Well, actually, guess what? When you start pitching customers, it's the same process all over again. And it's the same follow up and it's the same conversations. And so I would say kind of, you know, talk to us in six months or a year, we're going to have a different set of 
those challenges. But I think those two finding the right people and kind of um, getting the the product in the hands of customers to start learning from it and iterating on is um, is is really the, the the toughest part I think of of getting started, uh, among uh, other things. I would say there's always something. Right. right. As, I, as I say, it's, uh, you know, different sizes of, of company, different issues. Right. right. Um, for sure. So, well, I am so excited to get to know Prive a little bit more and get to know you guys a little bit more, too. And I'm really, really excited to watch this grow and and thrilled that you guys took the time to come and share more of the story with us. And hopefully you've inspired. I know you have uh, many people listening. So where do people find uh, you all on on which platform, uh, social media or um, also signing up for Prive. Let's get some downloads going for <laughs> Prive for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you can definitely follow our progress on our website, tryprive.com. Um, more to come there. Um, and also on our social channels, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you can find us both. Please reach out. Um, and then also my podcast, you can kind of hear a little bit about what's going on in, in, in our world through that through that platform. But um, we're, we're definitely excited to help solve subscriptions um, for DTC businesses. So definitely don't be shy. I, yes. I love it. And Alex, you too. What's your favorite social platform? I am not a big social user. I would say that that is probably one of those things that I will have to, to become better at in the founder journey. But I do say that I do enjoy Twitter, reading Twitter posts from time to time. I'm not a big Instagram person. I'm a huge Twitter person. And I, I was going to peg you as a Twitter yeah. as a Twitter person. Yeah. So I've met so many great people on Twitter, Correct, actually, yeah. and uh, that, are, that keep my curiosity um, you know, interested and people, uh, when I've needed help actually trying to figure, um, things out or recruitment too. Yep. Here's my plug for Twitter. I've, uh, definitely brought it out to people. So I love it. Very, very cool. Well, thank you guys. And thanks everybody for listening. I'm, I'm all over social at Kara golden with an I and, uh, as Claudia mentioned, my book, Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, came out uh, a few, actually, a year ago, which I can't believe it. It's been Congrats. like the craziest year, um, but it's really a story of building and, and uh, going through all of the things that startups go through and demystifying uh, the whole concept of, of entrepreneurs be f being fearless risk takers. I think they're just curious and wanting to learn and wanting to do new things that create change in many ways. So you guys are definitely a great example of it. I think Hint is as well. And I'm super excited uh, to share my story with people. If you want to pick up a copy of the book, listen to it on audio, audio and uh, on Audible. I can't talk this morning. And uh, and also pick up a case of Hint. If you haven't tried Hint as well, I'll put in the plug for the company and the product that I founded. And hopefully you'll come back and listen to our podcast every Monday and Wednesday and subscribe and uh, all of that. So thanks everyone for listening and we will see you soon.